Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, a program where we bring you the writings of the church. And we'll be taking a look at Blessed John Paul's uh, encyclical Fides et Ratio. But I want to mention that today is a feast of a number of Jesuit saints. Uh, these are Jesuits who were especially oriented towards the pastoral ministry. They worked mostly in, as pastors. Uh, St. Francis Regis was born in 1597 and died in 1640 in southern France. He worked uh, so successfully at converting prostitutes that the men in town tried to assassinate him a number of times. Uh, so, uh, but they didn't, they missed, uh, dropping loads of wood on him and things like that. Uh, he also would go out to the mountains in the winter and evangelize people who were locked away in the mountains. So um, he's one. Another is Saint Bernardino Realino, born in 1530 and died uh, for those days, very advanced age of uh, living in 1616. So he lived to be uh, 86 uh, years old. And he was so much beloved in the town where he worked out in southern Italy that when the superior said, well, it's time for you to go to another place, the townspeople closed the gates and uh, they, they uh, wouldn't let him leave. And then also St. Francis Jerome, born in 1642, died in 1716. And if you notice, St. Francis Jerome uh, and St. Uh, uh, Francis uh, Regis are both named Francis like our Pope. Uh, and there, there, there are, uh, and of course we still have Francis Xavier, a third Jesuit named Francis. So that was a very popular name with Jesuits. And, um, and then one is named Bernardino, also after a Franciscan saint. All right, um, let's, and we'll pray for all priests who are involved in pastoral ministry and the giving of retreats. Now, we are in Fides et Ratio. Uh, you can get a paperback copy of it from the Daughters of St. Paul. Go to their website, www.pauline.org. And in the online store, just type in Fides et Ratio and you can uh, get that. Or you can go to our website, EWTN.com, and you'll see a faith tab on the page. Click that. And there's a documents library on that tab. Click that <coughs> and type in Fides et Ratio, and you can download a free electronic copy of the encyclical and read from your computer or print it out. You've got to pay for your own printing. Um, and while you're at uh, EW10.com, uh, you can watch earlier programs, A Threshold of Hope, um, at EW10.com by clicking on where it says EW10 Live Shows, then click on Threshold and you see so many other shows. Now, we'd love to have you be involved and participate in the show. And one way to do it is like all these nice folks have done by coming here to Irondale, Alabama, just on the edge of Birmingham. So please, we'd love to have you come. Or you can also send us your question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call during our live broadcast, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number for that is 1-800-221-9529. Zero. Or if you are in Birmingham or if you're outside the country, you can simply call 205-271-2980. All right. We are now beginning chapter one. We've gone through the introduction and chapter one is called the revelation of God's wisdom. So that's where he's going to focus. And um, we begin with paragraph 7. 
because we already did the first six chapters, first six paragraphs in the introduction. And here in paragraph seven, the title is called Jesus, the Revealer of the Father. So Jesus Christ reveals God the Father. It's going to be the theme. So he begins. You know, underlying all of the church's thinking is an awareness that she bears a message which has its origin in God himself. The church is not a philosophy department. It's not some place where you just, you know, um, have a newspaper and make things up, some of which are true. Or it, it's uh, not just some ideology. The church understands itself as passing on a revelation God has taken the initiative to make. God revealed himself, and the church's role is to pass that on. In the Pope cites here 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, where therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So this has been one of the goals of the church, to the very best of our ability, to be able to pass on the word of God faithfully and to judge what we teach by that word and by the apostolic tradition. So that's why we have this revelation. The knowledge which the church offers to man has its origin not in her own speculation. That's not the basis where the church says, well, life could be like this, could be true. And this is very important because, um, you know, one of the things going on among certain modern philosophers is that they teach reality is whatever you say it is. And at that point, you can make anything up you want. If you take that as your philosophy, as in, say, deconstructionalism, you can make anything any words say anything you feel like you think they should say. The church doesn't want to do that at all. Rather, the, uh, the, the church sees the word of God, which she has received in faith, as the basis of her teaching. That's why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, St. Paul wrote, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now, well, by the way, this is a very interesting statement on little side point. First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 is where he says that, right? Pay attention to the fact that this is the first book of the New Testament to actually be written down. The Gospels were not written down yet when St. Paul wrote that in 51 AD. And so that's one reason that backs up something I said a minute ago, that it's scripture and the tradition. What he is speaking of 
as the Word of God is the Word He spoke. Because this is the first part of Scripture for the New Testament He's actually writing down. First Thessalonians. And so we see that the Word He spoke was one that He received from Christ and passed on. And that that is our task. Now we have that apostolic tradition and we have the New Testament. And we want to pass them on authentically. Now at the origin of our life of faith, there is an encounter that is unique in kind. And it's an encounter that discloses a mystery hidden for the ages. Now, where does the Pope get this idea that there is this mystery that we encounter? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, which is, by the way, the third book of the New Testament to be written down. He says in 1st, uh, St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glorification. So that there's a wisdom that God has spoken, and you see some of it revealed in the Old Testament, but it comes to its fullness in Jesus Christ. He, that's why He is the Word made flesh. And this Word is now revealed, as we see in, uh, the, uh, I don't know if you remember, but we went through the Vatican II document on Revelation called Dei Verbum, which means Word of God. And in paragraph 2 it says, In God's goodness and wisdom He chose to reveal Himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of His will, by which, through Christ, the Word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. And this uh, is something that is backed up by a line that he quotes from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. In His goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal Himself and to make Himself known, the hidden purpose of His will. Now, this hiddenness of God's will, the fact that God has this plan that He made known over time, revealing the plan slowly to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to Moses and the Israelites, later on to the Joshua and Judges, and the prophets, slowly, slowly, God unpacks His plan. And as they mature as a people, they get to understand more of it. Just like we do as children. When we're little kids, we see what's going on around us, but we don't understand it. But as we get older, and our mind is capable of understanding more, then we learn more. And life slowly, slowly makes more and more sense. And if you are a sensible person, you will not stop learning at the end of childhood, but you will keep learning until you die. That life always has new elements that you learn. Well, that's true in the history of Israel. Revelation kept going on until Christ came. Now, this initiative is utterly gratuitous. All right? In other words, where did this come from? Again, as he said at the beginning of the paragraph, it's not human beings speculating. 
It's not philosophy. And that doesn't mean philosophy is bad. Remember, Pope John Paul was a philosophy professor at Lublin University in Poland. So he's not against philosophy, but he is distinguishing revelation from philosophy. And as such, he is saying that the initiative for revelation is gratuitous. That is, it comes from God's grace. So gratuitous means it's free. It's from God's grace. And gratuitous and grace are from the same root in Latin. And therefore, it is moving from God to men and women in order to bring them to salvation. It's, he doesn't reveal things just so that you can say, well, that's a nice little data to know. God is not setting out a book of trivia for you to memorize about your favorite sports teams or his favorite sports teams. You know, what, what were some of the trivia about some of the big sports teams back in 500 BC? No, 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 no. That's not what he's trying to do. He gives us information about what is necessary for salvation so that the goal of what he reveals is that we don't go to hell and we do go to heaven. That's God's goal. Very important. And God is the source of love. Before we love, just like all of us as children, our parents loved us before we loved them. We didn't know how to love. Matter of fact, when, from the pictures I've seen, Little babies, as soon as they're born, look a little cranky. It's cold out here. And uh, they're crying and all this. And moms and dads pick, oh, so beautiful. And they, they just love their baby, right? So we have love from our parents before we love them. And we grow in that love all through life, God willing. And also from God. God is the source of love for all parenthood. Before there were any human parents, he loved. And that's the starting point. So God desires to make himself known. Just as a parent eventually helps a child learn how to say mommy and daddy. And as you get older, you learn to reveal more of yourself to your children. Again, as they're capable of understanding you. So also God desires to make himself known. And the knowledge which the human being has of God is a type of knowledge that perfects what the human mind can know about the meaning of life. Now, that's a very rich st statement. What it is saying is that all of us are going to find out a lot of things about how life is. Life is filled with lots of surprises and unexpected elements. And you don't know how life is going to go, but you learn over time to make sense out of life, right? But God's knowledge of himself is the perfection of that knowledge. All that we learn by our own experience and thinking is good, but God wants to perfect that and pull that together. He's not saying you're totally wrong, you're completely ignorant, but rather what he reveals will put into even greater sense what's going on. This is very important because, you know, one of the things I definitely notice about atheists, they have a very, very little bit of sense of humor. 
You have little, you know, they don't have, they, they will be cynical. And sometimes in their cynicism, they might have a funny line or two. But really being funny, you need believers for good jokes. Usually at our own expense, because we know our foibles better than the atheists. Atheists take themselves so seriously, they can't tell a good joke. Whereas all of us who take God more seriously than we take ourselves can have perspective on how silly we can be. I think there's something deeper behind that too. Now, we go on in paragraph eight. Restating almost to the letter, um, the teaching of the First Vatican Council now, most of you are too young to remember Vatican I. Uh, that was in 1870. I'm too young, too. There might be a few nuns around, but for the most part, no. You know, most of those people are passed away. Um, but in Vatican I, there was a constitution called Dei Filius, Son of God, it was called. Plus, we also go back even farther to the Council of Trent, especially, I think it was the fifth or sixth session on Revelation. And then we also go back to the Second Vatican Council. As we already cited De Verbum, the document on Revelation. The Church has been reflecting on the meaning of Revelation quite a bit, especially as people from the outside world criticize our teaching on the Bible, we respond in Trent, Vatican I, and in Vatican II. And here we see that um, the, in Vatican II, De Verbum pursued the age-old journey of understanding faith, so that faith is a gift. It's a relationship you have with God by which you trust God. That's the gift of faith. And faith, is, again, is not something you just make up. It's a gift from God, just like any other relationship is a gift from another person. And in that gift of a relationship, you learn to trust the other person more and more, God willing. Well, all, and then you want to understand them and know them better. So also, we, the, the church seeks to understand faith. The church therefore reflects on Revelation. And you see from the earliest centuries of the church, book after book, by father after father, in the saints and theologians, various reflections on Scripture. They always began with Scripture and tradition as the starting point from which they would reflect. Again, to understand better. And they want to reflect on Revelation in the light of Scripture. And they also and now, as we live at a later time, we look at the whole tradition of the fathers of the church. The fathers of the church are those early bishops and theologians, most of whom were bishops, who began writing. Many of these early bishops were disciples of the apostles. Uh, Saint Polycarp. And Saint Irenaeus, new apostles, and uh, excuse me, Saint, not Saint Irenaeus, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, Saint Ignatius of Antioch, and Saint Polycarp, new apostles, and Saint Irenaeus was their disciple, and others, uh, Saint Clement, uh, knew the uh, apostles. So we we have them, and then they come along and pass on their teaching, and they also trained other bishops and teachers, and they wrote. So we, 
when we talk about the age of the fathers, again, most of whom, not all, there were some laymen, uh, some deacons, some priests, but mostly bishops, who taught from the first beginning of the first century, Ignatius of Antioch was writing in 107, St. Clement of Rome was writing in 95, so when John was still alive, by the way. And uh, then others continue all the way. Usually they, they point out that the end of it would be about the 700s. Okay, with St. John of Damascus. So we use that whole tradition and go back and understand our faith with their help. And at the first Vatican Council, the fathers, the bishops that were there stressed the supernatural character of God's revelation. God's revelation comes by the Holy Spirit. And so scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit as Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II all say. He says standard church teaching. So it's, it's supernatural. And on the basis of you know, some people who made rationalist critiques, in other words, there were a group of thinkers in the, starting in the 1700s and going into the 1800s who began to re reflect on Scripture. They said it's true, but we can explain everything there with no miracles. And it's from those mostly German scholars that you get ideas such as well, Jesus didn't really multiply loaves and fish. He did a bigger miracle and got everybody to share the loaves and fish they had hidden under their cloaks. <laughs> I know I see some of you nodding because you've heard that in a sermon before, haven't you? <laughs> that is a rationalist German reflection. It is not church teaching at all. Can, and besides, can you imagine? My mother would be God at that way. She made me share with my brother and sister. <laughs> or you got these people, uh, hey, I've had this fish sandwich under my armpit for the last <laughs> five hours of Jesus teaching. Want some? <laughs> Jesus said I should give it to you. Yeah, you would. No, 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 no. This is, this is crazy. Crazy, crazy. And what they're trying to do is be rationalistic um, and thereby attack faith and make everything about reason alone, reason without faith. And they deny the possibility of any knowledge that doesn't come from natural reason. Only what you can know from thinking and science. That's the only thing that's true. All right, prove me, to me this scientifically. Your mother loves you. How are you going to prove that? Oh, yeah, she fed you. But maybe that was part of a plot. <laughs> maybe she just wanted to fatten you up and then throw you in the oven. <laughs> no, you, you make an act of faith that your mother loves you. You can't prove it by a scientific experiment. See, and if you can't prove that by reason alone, but also by the experience of living with your mother, how can you prove the things about God? So the first Vatican Council was obliged to reaffirm emphatically that there exists a knowledge that belongs peculiarly and especially to faith. And uh, there is a... a uh, this knowledge of, that comes from faith surpasses the knowledge that is proper to human reason. Not that reason is wrong. Not that reason is bad. Science is good. Philosophy is good. But no matter how profoundly you know that water is H2O, that won't get you to heaven. It won't even get you past seventh grade chemistry. You need to know more.
And when it comes to the knowledge of faith, you need to know something far more profound. And that um, yet at the same time, and this is where the balance was, the Vatican, First Vatican Council also said that human reason can learn that the Creator exists. So there are proofs, rational proofs, for the existence of God. And Aristotle had them, and St. Thomas perfected them, and it was more than we can go into now. But those are uh, 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 reason can discover that there is a God, but reason by itself cannot tell you that God is love. It can tell you God exists, God made the universe. You can learn that rationally on a number of different kinds of proof. But it cannot tell you God loves you. That takes revelation. Just like a biologist can tell you who your mother and father are by looking at theirs and your DNA. But a biologist cannot tell you that your mother and father love you. Can't. Can't prove it or disprove it. That's not his realm of knowledge. Same thing is true with faith in God. They can't prove or disprove that God loves you. Today, a lot of atheists in their humorless state hate God. They don't really argue against him so much as they hate him. And they're angry with him and vile about him. But, um, and that would be a good example, the opposite of faith. Disdain and sometimes even hatred. But we believe that God gives us uh, this gift of faith and a knowledge that goes with it. And that this knowledge that comes from faith expresses a truth based on the very fact of God who reveals himself, a truth which is most certain, since God neither deceives nor wishes to be deceived. He's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to harm us. God gives himself in the second person of the Trinity to die on a cross so that we can go to heaven and not go to hell. He cares profoundly about that. And, uh, and he doesn't want to trick us, and, um, uh, and, and he doesn't wish to be deceived. That's why it said in Vatican I, in Dei Filius, uh, section 3, since man is wholly dependent on God as his creator and Lord, and since created reason is completely subject to uncreated truth, which is God. Remember Jesus said, I am the truth? He is uncreated truth. Therefore, we are bound by faith to give full obedience of intellect and will to God who reveals himself. But the Catholic Church professes that this faith, which is the beginning of human salvation, is a supernatural virtue by which we, with the aid and inspiration of the grace of God, believe that the things revealed by him are true, not because the intrinsic truth of the revealed things has been perceived by the natural light of reason. So it's not true because my mind figured it out, but rather it is true because the authority of God himself, who reveals them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. So God gives that truth. And our task is simply to be faithful to the truth for no other reason except it's true. We're going to take a break Come back in a couple minutes and get questions from you calling in and from our studio audience here. So please stay with us.
Thank you very much and welcome back. Uh, we have a wonderful audience here from a wide variety of places, though the people who came here from the territory of Guam win the Long Distance Award. So it's good to have you here. But <laughs> and if you can come and join us here at EWTN, we'd love to have you. Please contact our pilgrimage department. You can call them at 205-271-2966 or go to the website www.ewtn.com. They'll give you lots of information about um, the programs uh, on the uh, uh, what time you can be in the studio audience, uh, times for masses, directions to get up to hands full, places to stay and eat and all that. So I'd love to have you all come and join us. Now, before we go to our questions, I want to mention, first of all, we must pray for all the folks, the Christians and the Muslims, in particular in Syria and in Egypt right now. Uh, I don't know uh, if you heard this yet, but a Franciscan, Father Francois Murad, was murdered in northern Syria on June 23rd. Uh, there were stories that he was decapitated, uh, but in fact, he was shot. You know, that was confirmed later on. The decapitation videos were uh, of some other place. But still, he, he was shot. And he was trying to protect the sisters from some uh, Muslim radicals. Uh, this is a situation that's very, very serious. As a matter of fact, we mentioned a few weeks ago, and again, just a few times over the last few weeks, uh, a Syrian Orthodox bishop and a Greek Orthodox bishop, from, both from Syria, were crossing the border, and radicals kidnapped them. No one has heard anything about them since. This is not a good thing. So uh, there are a wide variety of communities in Syria that are very ancient. And um, this is uh, something that we have to pay close attention to, uh, especially we have to keep in mind that, um, you know, we you know, don't want to add by any of our own government policies uh, to the violence in Egypt or in Syria. So we want to pray that uh, a peaceful settlement can be done. I don't know if it can. Uh, the situation seems out of hand. Over 100,000 people have died already, and tens of thousands are um, uh, uh, in exile right now. So uh, do pray for the folks there, in particular, all of our Christian brothers of the Orthodox communities, the Catholic communities, uh, the, the Melkites, Maronites, and Latins, and so many others. Okay. All right, we have a caller. Uh, hello, George. George, are you there? Oh, yes. Hi, good afternoon, Father. Mitchell. Good afternoon. Where are you from? I'm from Berwyn, Illinois. Oh, you know, I thought I heard that Chicago accent. Well, yeah, it's, we're just outside of Chicago. Right, so right, right, right. Some of the, some of the slang or whatever is just yep. with us. And what's your question? Uh, yes, Father Mitchell, I was hoping I could ask you a question on a thing. Um, do we know if Muhammad was a descendant of Ishmael? Well, in this sense, that the Arab people were all descendants of Ishmael just like the people of Israel were descendants of uh, Isaac. So, um, yeah, you know, so in that sense, on a very general sense, he was a descendant of uh, Ishmael. But, um, you know, one of the things is that in the Quran, um, there is no direct lineage between Muhammad and Ishmael, but just in general because he's an Arab, um, the, that the Arab people are descendants of Ishmael, the son of uh, Abraham, and the Egyptian slave, Hagar. Does that help? I guess he's gone. All right. We have a question here from our studio audience. 
Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Great, and what's your question? My question, Father, is why do we consider St. Paul an apostle mm -hmm. as opposed to an early church father? Good question. One of the keys is that uh, when you look at the New Testament, he is called apostolos. The word apostle or apostolos in Greek comes from a Greek verb, apostolein, which means to send. And St. Paul was sent out and commissioned to go and preach to others, but also one of the distinguishing marks of him as an apostle is that he also saw the risen Lord Jesus on the way to Damascus in Syria. So having witnessed Jesus raised from the dead and, and, heard, from, and heard him speak, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then having been sent out by Jesus, remember Jesus uh, commissioned him, you know, and said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And then he was sent out also by the church at Antioch by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what made him apostolos, one who had been sent. Okay? You're welcome. We have another caller. Hello, Priscilla. Hello, Father Mitch. I like your name. I went to St. Priscilla Grammar School. Oh. <laughs> where are I like you from? my name, too. Uh, where, where are you from? Methuen, Massachusetts. Oh, great. And what's your question? Um, in Matthew chapter, chapter 6, Mm -hmm. It says, um, when you pray, do not heap up phrases, multiply words, repeating the same ones over and over, as the Gentiles do, but they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Mm -hmm. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then He goes on to say, pray like this, the Our Father. Right. And this confuses me because... Sure. I say the rosary, which is repeating words, and the Divine Mercy Chaplet. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on this. And also I wanted to ask you, a lot of times when I say the rosary, I can't concentrate at all. I say the whole rosary, and I, I can't focus. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me, let me try to respond to both of those, Priscilla. First of all, what it says in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6 is that in praying, do not heap up empty phrases. And the um, Greek word that's used there is related to the word babble or uh, jibber jabber. Or something. It'd be the equivalent of don't jibber jabber, all right? And that's what they, then this one says, don't, um, uh, you know, heap up empty phrases. Well, by empty phrase, they're, they're trying to interpret that because uh, saying a word that would be kind of equivalent to don't jibber jabber means don't speak nonsense. Don't say just empty nonsense. But, you know, when you pray, say the Our Father. Now, it says don't repeat uh, that. Uh, as a matter of fact, don't heap that up. Um, but it doesn't say you cannot repeat the words of sacred scripture. So when you are praying the rosary, you're saying, Hail Mary, full of grace, from Luke 1.26. The Lord is with thee, from the same verse. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. It's also from Luke chapter 1, verse 36, 37. So, you know, I don't want to call the words of sacred scripture babbling on or jabber, jibber jabber. And you may repeat those. It's not a problem. But just repeating nonsense syllables, that's what's being forbidden. Now, some uh, people want to say, shouldn't repeat prayers at all. Why not? Remember what Jesus taught in the Gospel of St. Luke, I believe it's chapter 18, that there was an unjust judge. 
And there was a widow who had a case. And she kept going back to him and presenting her case. And he, he said, I don't care about God or man, but this woman's driving me crazy. <laughs> so I'll just get rid of her and answer, the, answer what she wants. Well, God is willing to answer, you know, and, and calls us. And, there's, and see, Priscilla, this gets to your second question. When we are repeating the words of Scripture, say in the rosary, it's also a prayer I say every day. You know, it's not just saying the Hail Marys. One of the reasons you might have trouble concentrating is that you may need to have a little bit of help in meditating on the mysteries. One of my favorite little books, matter of fact, I, uh, when I travel, I always keep it in my computer bag, and that is a scriptural rosary. And for each Hail Mary, it has one verse from the Bible related to that mystery of the rosary. And there's a new edition that also includes the luminous mysteries. You may want to try that. And, you know, say the Hail Mary, then read that verse. That'll slow you down. Oh, I don't have time to do that. Well, divide it up. Do it at different times. But use that as a way to meditate on the mystery. As Blessed John Paul had said, that the rosary, that saying the Hail Mary's glory be in our fathers is the body of the rosary. The mysteries and meditating on the mysteries are the soul of the rosary. So do both. That'll help. We have another question from our studio. It's, Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Good to have you here. I like Louisville a lot. Thank and you. what is your question? Uh, if I understood what you were saying a moment ago regarding the writings, that revelation is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit? Right. Okay. Would that also not apply to, uh, say, Joseph Smith's uh, revelation of the Book of Mormon okay. and the founding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? All right. Let's, what we have to do is take a look at that. Okay? And the only way to do that is something I've done, which is to read the Book of Mormon. Okay? Now, one of the things when you look at the first book of Nephi, in the Book of Mormon, chapter 13, it says that there uh, was a church founded by Satan. And they used um, silks and linens and all this other, and incense and all this other stuff. And that from that church, there were many daughter churches that were founded by other demons. What do you think he's talking about? Yeah, yeah, it's First Nephi chapter 13. And one of the things, what he's obviously talking about, as Mormon um, uh, folks uh, ha uh, have um, said, that that is referring to the Catholic Church. Now, so then they're saying the Catholic Church was founded by Satan, and the Protestant churches by other demons. And today, they don't like to admit that, but that is in the uh, older Mormon commentaries, like Bruce McConkie and others. And so then, and here's then where we have a problem. How does that fit the word that Jesus Christ taught when he said that, Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church? and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The Book of Mormon says, oh, the gates of hell did prevail against it. So that if I believe Joseph Smith, then I have to conclude Jesus Christ was wrong. That's, th th does that make sense? And, you know, and just one other thing on, on a more natural level. Uh, in the Book of Mormon, I've read it very carefully, uh, more than once, and in there um, you see mention 
uh, there's a great battle at the hill Cumorah. And it mentions that there were chariots with horses and uh, uh, iron weapons and steel weapons and brass and bronze and all this. Uh, and that when the Nephites and all the others came to, the Lamanites came to America, there were uh, an abundance of sheep and, ho uh, and horses and cattle. So when I've gone to various Mormon centers, you know, at Hill Cumorah, Joseph Smith's home in upstate New York, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Nauvoo, Illinois, the first temple outside of Cleveland, and so on. Um, I asked a question, can you show me a single bone of a horse before the Spanish got here? A single cow bone, a piece of brass, bronze, or steel? or a single wheel, because Native Americans had never invented the wheel. So what he says in the Book of Mormon was in abundance, there is zero evidence for. And in checking with their uh, official uh, church archeologist, I've got a copy of a letter he wrote saying, none of these things can be true. Whereas, in the New Testament, I can go to uh, Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus had spoken, you are rocking on this rock, I'll build my church, and see a rock cliff behind it. I can go to the house of Peter in Capernaum, and on the rocks, Peter's name is scratched in as an ancient graffito. I can see the house of Mary where they found a piece of pottery saying a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, they called him Emmanuel, first century pottery from probably the 60s. And her name is carved as a graffito on the, the rocks there. And on and on and on. So when I look at the data of the New Testament, I, I see it, I, that's why I go to Israel. When I look at the claims of the Book of Mormon, there's no possibility. <laughs> So that's also very important. We have another question from our studio audience. Man, we've only got about a minute and a half, I'm afraid. But Real quick. What's your question? Uh, real quick. I just wanted to ask you, Father, in terms of um, the headscarf there, I was in Israel in 2002 mm -hmm. and assisted our brothers and sisters, Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Please explain to me how I can use something from Revelation, divine, divinely inspired, to help with the conversation, the dialogue. Sure. You know, it, it's... it's very complicated. Uh, one of the things, just very briefly, go to my website, fathermitchpacwa.org, and I have a, a whole slew of CDs that give expanded teaching. But one of the things you have to do is also say, look, the, book, the Quran makes claims that are contradicted by the gospel, same as in the Book of Mormon. The Quran says Jesus was not crucified in Surah 4, verse 157. Now, the Gospels say he was, and the Virgin Mary was there. And what I've even asked Muslims, whom do I believe? Muhammad, who 600 years later says Jesus was not crucified, or the Lady Mary, who saw Jesus crucified, they'd taken away, see, that says, oh, he was all covered up. No, they took away the clothes she made for him. And she buried him. So, you know, we have to learn how to pose good questions. And there's a lot more to it than that. But we are out of time. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And remember, this program is brought to you by you. We can have these because of your support. And especially in the summertime, we need that. So please keep us in between the gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we will pay for our bills too. Thank you.